Excellent. All right, welcome all. I'm Matt Church with the Berkeley Public Library. Really excited to have you here tonight. Uh, I'd like to give a big thanks to the friends of the Berkeley Public Library for sponsoring tonight's talk. Uh, we have Russell Doré here with us. Um, he's done some great programs for us in the past. Uh, we're excited to have him back tonight uh, on the subject of electric cars, past, present, and future. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over. Uh, I will just say real quickly, if you could just hold your questions until the end of the talk, uh, we'll make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A uh, once he's done with the presentation. All right, enjoy. Thank you. I, uh, are you seeing it's full screen here or not? I had, uh, no, not uh, currently. It was I, had that, uh, I had that message pop up about uh, um, being recorded. Got it. No, when I hit that, something changed here. Okay, it looks like you can oh. click on resume slideshow. Oh, yeah. Okay, there yeah. it is. Okay. All right. Um, well, good evening. The uh, electric cars is a, is a hot topic these days. Uh, back in the uh, early 1900s, electric cars were uh, more popular than internal combustion cars. And we want to know who were some of the pioneers that got that started. Uh, then electric cars pretty much disappeared. And we want to know why that happened. And then in the 2000s, they reappeared again. We want to know why that happened. And we want to know who some of the pioneers were when that happened. So that's what we're going to talk about. So let's start at the beginning. The, uh, this three-wheeled electric powered vehicle is driven in Paris, 1881 by its inventor, Gustave Trouvet. It's considered one of the first working electric automobiles. Now for comparison, the first practical gasoline engine was attributed to Carl Benz five years later. So the electric actually got uh, a jump on the uh, internal combustion engine. That was considered the first gasoline uh, powered vehicle, the practical one. Um, now the first electric vehicles used lead acid batteries. First production electric car was built by Thomas Parker in 1884 in London. Uh, Ross, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. We're not seeing the full screen. Um, we're still seeing the kind really? of presenter. Oh, we're seeing okay. all your slides and then the main oh, one okay. with your notes okay. at the okay. bottom. Great. Now, thanks for checking that. Uh, yeah. Well, let me do this. Um, um, We end the show and um, you might want to end your screen share and then start it over again. It looks like maybe your screen is frozen on the screen share. Oh, okay. It doesn't it doesn't show your mouse moving around at all. Oh, okay. Let me let me get this. Uh, let me find the the um, the one I need here and get that on on here anyway. Okay, now um, uh, I'll stop the share, I guess. Oh, it is. Share. It is. Yeah, it is moving now. If you want to new go share. up to, oh, okay. If you want to go up to slideshow and then start slideshow. Yeah. Okay. We're on the Edison Electric slide right now. Okay. Perfect. Okay, that's working. Yep, we can see Edison Electric now, full screen. Okay. If anyone yeah, else sees anything different? Let us know. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. It uh, has a mind of its own sometimes. Well, in 1889, Thomas Edison built an experimental vehicle primarily to promote his new nickel iron batteries that he thought were better than the lead acid. Now he had several of his batteries installed in other makes of cars, but uh, he, he had quite a statement about electric cars. He thought they were the real future. He said, electricity is the thing. There is no whirring and grinding gears with their numerous levers to confuse. There's not that almost terrifying, uncertain throb and whir of the powerful combustion engine. There is no water circulating system to get out of order, 
no dangerous and evil smelling gasoline and no noise. So again, he thought that electric was the future. And of course, those are some attributes that uh, turned out to be pretty popular. <clears throat> William Morrison at Des Moines, Iowa, is credited with building the first successful battery powered electric automobile in America. He was Scottish born, arrived in Des Moines in 1880. And again, his chief interest was in batteries. He built an electric vehicle in 1890 to use his batteries and it received much interest. The World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. This was the first hybrid. It was produced from 1900 to 1905. Had an electric motor in each wheel hub, gave four wheel drive, run on the battery, uh, powered electric motors or a gasoline engine, but it was very heavy. It had 44 lead acid batteries. It was very expensive. A few were built for European royalty. The technology, however, was used to build some rear wheel drive buses for Berlin. This is a 1906 French electric car produced by the Krieger Company of Paris. Shown in the car are its owner, George Wetmore and his wife. Now he was at that time a Senator from Rhode Island, US Senator became governor of Rhode Island. Now the Krieger automobiles were the first to use regenerative electric brakes, which again, they're using now. In 1903, he also produced a hybrid electric vehicle with the front wheel drive power steering and a gasoline engine that supplemented the battery pack. Now um, I have, I'm gonna tilt my screen a little bit. I have a, um, a colorized version of this on my shirt. My, my daughter Kelly found it for me online. Uh, again, the original pictures weren't in color, so whoever wanted to put them on shirts decided that they would, uh, they would colorize it and, and put it on the shirts. So uh, anyway, that, that was kind of a fun, fun gift. Well, the Baker Electric uh, was founded in 1899 in Cleveland. And in 1906, they produced 800 cars. So they were the largest electric car manufacturer in the country. One of them was sold to Thomas Edison and his nickel iron batteries were used in some of their cars. Now Baker Electric was part of the first White House fleet of cars driven by Helen Taft, wife of President William Howard Taft. In 1908, the Detroit Electric Company began making cars and they surpassed the Baker Company in 1910. Clara Ford, Henry Ford's wife, drove a Detroit Electric until Ford added a self-starter in 1919. Uh, women uh, didn't like to use the crank. Uh, men didn't either, particularly, but uh, particularly women. Some of them didn't feel they were strong enough to crank it, and also it could uh, whip backwards and break your wrist. So uh, uh, they, uh, they opted, many of them, for the electric car. Now, her, her Detroit Electric was purchased in 1914 for $3,700 and had a range of 80 miles. Now for comparison, the Ford Model T at that time was selling for under $500. So you could see the electrics were definitely uh, much more expensive. Well, what happened in uh, 1908 that changed things? Well, the same year as the Detroit Electric started, Henry Ford introduced his Model T. Now, his company had been in existence for five years. Through the use of the assembly line, he reduced the price of the car from $850 to $250 a car for basically the same car. Now people could choose this low price gasoline vehicle with far greater range than the electrics. And so this started the demise of the electrics. The electrics were more, far more expensive and also had a limited range. Now, when the self-starters were added by Ford in 1919, again, this further drastically reduced the appeal of the electrics because now you didn't need to use a crank on the internal combustion. <clears throat> well, by 1913, though, Henry Ford got interested in electric cars along with his friend Thomas Edison. This experimental vehicle is shown outside Ford's Highland Park plant. Now, Ford insisted on using Edison's nickel iron batteries uh, because Edison was his buddy, but it turned out they weren't quite as good as the lead acid batteries used by other companies. Also, the range of the car was only 50 to 100 miles between charges. And as we said, the Model T 
It's coming down in price, captured 50% of the market in the country. And because of, of the a low range, the driving range problem with the electrics and the huge uh, cost factor, uh, the Model T was, was uh, certainly uh, more popular and Ford dropped his electric car project. Uh, as we'll see later, 100 years later, Ford will, will invest billions in electric car development. But certainly that wasn't a bad decision at the time because there just wasn't the technology to continue the electric cars at that time. Well, let's jump forward to the 1960s. Pollution from automobiles and industrial sources became a major problem, particularly in California. Los Angeles sits in a basin surrounded by mountains. The ocean winds blow that smog up against the mountains and the, the warm air keeps it from rising. And so you have this terrible smog. Uh, I lived there in the early 70s. When I flew into LA, you couldn't even see buildings like this. You could just see a brown layer until you got beneath the smog and then you could see the city all of a sudden appear. The, um, the Pasadena track team uh, right outside of LA had to be bussed out of the valley to practice because of the uh, effect on the lungs of the, of the track teams. So due to the concern about pollution in their lungs, research began to show that the automobile was one of the main sources of pollution. The Clean Air Act was passed in 1963, and then in 70, uh, President Nixon formed the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and auto pollution regulations were established to reduce the carbon dioxide gases. So that was the big impetus for the rebirth of an alternative. So um, let's take a look at some of the early efforts. This Sun Racer was a race car financed by GM, powered by solar cells feeding into silver zinc batteries. Carried one person, only weighed 100, 575 pounds. It was built for a solar car race in Australia. It won the race. And a couple of follow-up models were developed, but the concept never went anywhere, but they did use some of the technology later. So who are some of the early pioneers that led to the rebirth of the electrics? Well, enter a young man named Wally Ripple. 1968, as an undergraduate student, he built a Caltech electric car. Now this is a converted 58 VW microbus filled with batteries. He won the great transcontinental electric car race against MIT. In the 70s and 80s, Ripple worked for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on electric vehicle battery research, among other things. And then around 1990, he joined AeroVironment and helped to design the GM Impact, which was later named the EV1. The White Zombie. In 1998, this 92 uh, or 72 Datsun was loaded with batteries and won many drag races against gasoline cars with high horsepower engines. Could do it because, of course, there's no transmission to slow down the power transfer to the wheels. So all of a sudden, this got people's attention. They thought, wow, electric vehicles are pretty zippy. They're not just this kind of slow moving thing that you would expect. 96, GM introduced the EV1, an all electric four passenger car, using some of the technology from the Sun Racer. You couldn't buy one, you had to lease it from a Saturn dealer, a subsidiary of GM. Oops, excuse me. Mel Gibson and uh, Danny DeVito were early customers. It cost far more to build and was covered by the lease payments. So GM lost heavily on this program, decided not to go ahead with further refinements. However, they didn't want these out there circulating for corporate image and liability reasons. So they crushed all the cars as they came off of lease. In 2003, Wally Ripple was one of the participants in a mock funeral for the EV1 as GM prepared to collect the last few for crushing. Ripple left AeroVironment in 2006 and joined Tesla Motors, where he continued his lifelong work on the battery electric car. He left Tesla in 2008. In 2006, a movie was produced examining the forces that killed the EV1. They included changing environmental regulations, conservative auto industry, executives. For instance, Rick Wagner, GM's former CEO, is the one that shut down the program, said later in life that his worst decision as CEO 
was axing the EV1 and not transitioning into um, hybrids. 1999, Honda became the first hybrid available in the US until the Prius was introduced. The Honda Z1 was followed by the Honda Insight, which at one time was one of the best selling hybrids in the US. The Toyota Prius hybrid was introduced in Japan in 97, making it the world's first mass produced hybrid. It was introduced in the US in 2000. It features a battery and a gasoline engine. And the battery is charged when the car brakes and by the gasoline engine. And a computer selects which uh, power is more effective for the speed and the situation you're in, whether it's a gasoline engine or the, um, uh, or the battery. This was named Car of the Year by Motor Trend in 2004. 2013, Prius had sold 50% of all the hybrid cars in the US. Several celebrities drove a Prius. Larry David, writer for the Seinfeld show, owned one. So did actor Leonardo DiCaprio. This gave a lot of visibility to the Prius and to electric hybrids in general. And along came the Nissan Leaf, introduced in 2000. And this was the world's best-selling electric hybrid from 2011 to 2014 and again in 2016. This was manufactured in Japan, Britain, and Smyrna, Tennessee. Ford got into the business with its first hybrid in 2005, the Escape SUV. They added the Fusion sedan in 2010, again, Motor Trend Car of the Year that year. Chevy got into it in 2011 with the Volt hybrid. Although a hybrid, it operates as a pure electric until a battery level drops to a certain level and then a small gasoline engine runs to charge the battery. It was Motor Trend Car of the Year that year. Became the all-time best-selling plug-in electric car in the US in 2018. And yes, that is President Obama driving this vault to promote electric car development. BMW offered the i3 hybrid. Chrysler came out with a Pacifica hybrid minivan in 2017. VW introduced the e-Golf hybrid in 2019. Hyundai has a Tucson hybrid, Toyota the Highlander, and Toyota the RAV, RAV4 hybrid. So uh, a lot of people are getting into the business. We're focusing primarily on the US uh, manufacturers. <clears throat> so uh, Jeep came out with the hybrid models of the Wrangler and the Grand Cherokee. The Cherokee will be built at the Stellantis, that's a new name for uh, um, Chrysler, um, the Stellantis uh, Mack Avenue plant in Detroit. Now this is the first new plant in Detroit in 30 years. Jeep forecasts that 70% of its sales will be electrified by 2025. President Biden drove one of these around the White House grounds at a recent press conference. Maybe you saw that, they had a bunch of them out there and he. He picked out the, the Jeep Wrangler and drove it around the grounds. Let's look at some of the early pioneers. <clears throat> Martin Eberhardt was an electrical engineer and co-founder of Tesla Motors in San Carlos, California in 2003 and its first CEO. Fortunately, left the company in 2008 under accusations of falsifying financial data. Bart Tarpening was the other co-founder of Tesla. After graduating from Berkeley, Spent several years working in Saudi Arabia for Textron. He and a friend, or he and Martin Eberhard, we just talked about, founded Nouveau Media, a company that built an early ebook. Well, it was called a rocket book. And in 98, it was purchased by TV guy Gemstar for 187 million. Well, that gave them some money and they wanted to get into the car business. So they collaborated and found, founded Tesla Motors. They named it after Nikola Tesla, the Serbian-American pioneer of alternating current. Tarpening served as a chief financial officer and later vice president of electrical engineering in Tesla until 2008 when he left the company. There was actually a third co-founder, Jeffrey Staubel, um, chief technical officer until 2019, graduated from Stanford with a BS in energy systems, MS in energy engineering, named Innovator of the Year in 2008 by MIT's Technology Review. 
in their category of innovators in the world under age 35. Well, I'm sure you recognize this fella. Um, let's take a look at his background. I know you heard about him. You may not know much about his background. He was born and raised in Pretoria, South Africa. Moved to Canada when he was 17, attended Queen's University. Transferred to the University of Pennsylvania two years later. Got a bachelor's degree in economics from Wharton School. Bachelor's degree in physics from the College of Science and Arts. He began a PhD in applied physics and material sciences at Stanford University in 1995 but dropped out after two days to pursue an entrepreneurial career. And of course, we know how that worked out. I'm not sure that he ever uh, regretted uh, not, not staying there and working on that degree. Anyway, he co-founded Zip2 with his brother Kimball. That was a web software company. Compaq bought that for 340 million in 99. So he took that money and founded X.com, an online bank, that merged with Cofinity in 2000. They're the company that launched PayPal and they bought uh, his company um, uh, or eBay bought the company for 1.5 billion in October of 2002. So now uh, Musk had a lot of money. He founded SpaceX, an aerospace manufacturing space transport services company, which he is CEO and lead designer. And you've seen a lot of uh, pictures, I'm sure, of uh, the uh, launches of his, his uh, spaceships. He joined Tesla in 2004, one year after it was founded, became its CEO and product architect in 2006. He also inspired the creation of Solar City that makes solar panels and uh, operates as its chairman. In January 2021, he became the richest man in the world with a net worth of $202 billion. Maybe now he can afford a necktie. I, I guess he never uh, he never read the book Dress for Success. So let's look at his cars. The Roadster was the first highway legal serial production all electric car to use lithium ion ion batteries, and the first production all electric car to travel more than two hundred miles per charge. This was based on a Lotus chassis. The Model S is an all electric five door liftback produced in 2012, introduced in 2012. Uh, it had a, a long range version that could go 373 miles on a charge, higher than any other battery electric car. Built in California, priced at about $80,000. The EPA rated this uh, one of their models uh, at 104 miles per gallon equivalent. So the same money you would spend to drive a, um, uh, a car, uh, a gasoline powered car, uh, you'd get equivalent of 104 miles a gallon uh, on the electric. Well, this is Motor Trend Car of the Year in 2013 uh, and the top selling plug-in electric car worldwide in 2015 and 16. Model S's were built, or Model S's built after October, 2016 have the option of autonomous driving, feature that allows the car to operate without assistance from the driver, but the driver is supposed to uh, be paying attention and take over if they have to. Um, the feature is called autopilot. There's been at least one fatal crash using autopilot, but the driver wasn't paying attention as required. Now they've added autopilot 2.0. Uh, this gives you some more features. It has a sensory modes, senses and records suspicious activities around the car. And it also has, they call enhanced summons, which allows the car to drive through a parking lot to find you without anybody in the driver's seat. My son has a uh, Tesla uh, Model 3 and he, uh, he has that feature. And I've asked him if he ever used it. He said, yeah, he's used it a couple of times at a restaurant. So the... Uh, Cassie on the Tesla is really a large battery with an electric engine at the front. And that's the way uh, the platforms are for many of the all electrics. In 2016, they introduced the Model X SUV with uh, gull wing rear doors. And then they introduced a, a more reasonably priced uh, Model 3 in 2017. This has a range of about 300 miles 
It became the all-time best-selling plug-in electric in the U.S. in 2019. Um, sells for around 45 to 55,000. Now get this, this is a, a fascinating. As a company, Tesla's value is more than GM and Ford combined. Let me repeat that. Tesla's value on the stock market is valued more than GM and Ford combined. Now, this is in spite of the fact that electric cars were less than 2% of the market in 2019. So this high valuation of the company isn't based on current sales, but on future potential. And evidently the stock uh, market thinks that uh, electric is the way to go and that Tesla is way out in front. <clears throat> because uh, GM, Ford and uh, Stellantis earn more profits than Tesla. They came out with a Model Y crossover this year uh, with a third row option, shares many of the components of the Model 3 and is a little bit heavier and comes in a four wheel drive. <clears throat> How about Chevy? Well, they got into the uh, business in 2017, or it was a voted motor trend car of the year in 2017. And this is made at the Lake Orion plant. Electric car customers are allowed a 7,500 dollar tax credit, but once a manufacturer sold 200,000 cars, it's no longer allowed. So unfortunately, GM has reached that cap. And uh, so GM buyers can't get that uh, $7,500 tax credit. Um, US Senator Debbie Stabenow tried last year to get that change in Congress, but it failed. Now, unfortunately, GM just had a recall of all of these vehicles due to battery uh, fire risk. And they're working very hard to solve that. And uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really thrown them for a loop, but they are uh, making progress to, to find out uh, what the battery issues were. <clears throat> Toyota came out with a Mirai model at the Washington Auto Show. Now this uses hydrogen fuel cells rather than batteries. The advantage is here you can fill up in five minutes at a fueling station instead of sitting there for an hour or so while it charges at a charging station. And you can drive 400 miles without refueling. Well, the problem is kind of obvious. Uh, there aren't any hydrogen fueling stations around yet. So uh, it, it's kind of uh, unknown as, as to how far the hydrogen uh, um, fuel cell power is going to go. What about um, Ford? Well, that's putting all its chips on its new all electric Mustang, Mach E SUV. It says a 300 mile range sell for around 35,000 after the tax incentive. Now Ford's investing 11 and a half billion in electric car development. They're hoping for acceptance by using one of their top brands. So they're betting uh, one of their top brands. And of course, if it doesn't go, it not only hurts their electric cars, but it hurts their one of their top brands, the Mustang. Uh, so they really took quite a, quite a gamble. They were very confident. And so far it's getting great acceptance. It's selling well and they're, planning, uh, G, uh, Ford is planning 16 fully electric vehicle models by 2022. Now the Mustang, you know, the electric cars don't have, make any noise. So you need a little bit of noise to, to warn people if you're backing up and so forth and driving by. Um, so they do have uh, artificial sounds and the Mustang sounds were created by an electronic sound artist inspired by science fiction film soundtracks. I don't know if you get your choice or not. But it was just announced um, a couple of days ago that uh, Ford has sold 100,000 of these to Hertz rental, uh, which is a, a major, major step in bringing that um, electric cars out to the rental market and uh, in uh, pushing that Mustang out. <clears throat> well, uh, to promote it, they're gonna schedule a cross country trip and this will replicate a trip made by a Ford Model T in 1909. So here's a uh, um, refurbished Model T from that area uh, that uh, is, uh, replicates the car that went across the country uh, back then. And here's the Mustang. Now, uh, my nephew uh, invited me to come into a, a restoration shop in Wixom where they were getting this car ready. 
for the trip. Now it's going to be in New York when the Mustang leaves, and it's going to be in Seattle when it when it arrives. And uh, that was that was quite a thrill. Um, the only thing about that race, uh, Ford Ford did win it, but um, about two weeks after the race, uh, it was discovered that they had stopped in St. Louis and changed engines, which was against the rules. So I don't know that they ever took the trophy away from them, but it, it certainly it certainly soured. Uh, soured that victory uh, for them. Okay, let's look at some of the other uh, pioneers. It's kind of fun to know who, who you know, we know Ford and Durant and Chrysler back from uh, the pioneers of the internal combustion, but who are some of the people that are pioneering in this new field? Um, this is Bob Tianaka. He's Ford's top battery technology guy. He designed space batteries for NASA worked on the batteries for successful Jupiter probe mission. He lives in Plymouth, Michigan. Now he was obviously a car guy from an early age. He was concerned about smog in LA later, so he studied chemical engineering. It's a great sense of humor. He said, when I was nine, I was certainly I was gonna become a baseball player for the LA Dodgers. But in junior high, a career survey said I should become a park ranger. Well, I figured I'd do that after playing baseball but I got cut from the varsity team in the 11th grade. So that ended his baseball hopes. So he says, maybe after I retire from Ford, I'll work for the Detroit Tigers, get back in baseball and as an usher, which is kind of like a park ring. Another local electric car pioneer, uh, RJ Scaringe. His love affair with things that move, as he puts it, began as a child. Soon as he's old enough to handle tools, he helped a neighbor build a Porsche in his garage in Melbourne, Florida. By high school, he'd become obsessed with the idea of building his own brand of automobiles. And so he gained that knowledge uh, by earning his doctorate in mechanical engineering from MIT's Sloan Automotive Lab. He spent years building a dream team of engineers in Plymouth, Michigan, and designers, including Mark Vinnels, Rivian's executive director of engineering, came from McLaren, and Jeff Hammond, Hammond, vice president of design and a veteran of Jeep, where he oversaw the Grand Cherokee and the Wrangler. Now he needed funding to uh, fund his electric dreams. So he was able to raise $450 million from three major investors in Saudi Arabia, Japan, and London. Incidentally, if he looks young, it is because he was born in 1983. Yes, he's 38. So let's look at his product, the Rivian. They're gonna build the R1S SUV, seven seat sport utility vehicle, and then a pickup version, um, very similar, based on the same skateboard style design. <clears throat> now they claim to offer outstanding performance. They get 400 miles of range, more than any other uh, by current uh, that's on the road, and promise exceptional handling and sports car speed able to sprint from zero to 60 in three seconds and off-road capability. So um, I guess that's, uh, you can't drive your Tesla really off-road much, but this is uh, something you can drive on the dunes or upper Rocky Hill. <clears throat> and this will have a base price around 68,000. The SUV will be about 72,000. Now they expect to deliver 20,000 units uh, this year and 40,000 next year. So it's about uh, 1.4 billion in sales this year and 2.8 billion next year. They're gonna be built in Normal, Illinois in a former Mitsubishi plant. If you get a chance, go to the Rivian uh, website. There's a, there's a neat video on their website of, of these cars in action. And again, they have the skateboard type chassis. Uh, and uh, they have a battery pack, drive units, uh, thermal system. Each wheel of theirs is uh, powered by an electric motor mounted between the hubs, and they'll have three different battery packs. Uh, one of them can push the range up to 400 miles. <clears throat> now they had a major, uh, major coup. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, they, they've uh, got investments of $700 million. Uh, Ford invested 500 million. Uh, Cox Automotive invested uh, some more. 
and uh, brought, brought their investment up to 1.5 billion. So they've got plenty of money funding it. And this year, Amazon announced they were buying 100,000 of these delivery vans from Rivian. And that really, really kind of put them on the map. And uh, so they're going to complete, convert its delivery fleet to 100% renewable by 2030. So there's going to be gradually introducing those 100,000 over the next uh, 10 years. So you'll be seeing some electric Amazon vans around before too long. Uh, they're coming out with a pickup truck for around 70,000. So let's see what else is going on in electric uh, power. Motive Power Systems uh, provides electric power systems to convert Ford E45 trucks from Ford's Avon Lake plant in Ohio. They're also planning electric versions of its transit delivery van for next year. Roush has developed a mid-sized electric delivery van for Penske by mounting an electric motor and battery in a Ford 650 van. This is built in the Detroit area and is being tested in California. Tesla's coming out with an electric truck. You might have seen some pictures of these. It sells for about $40,000. Certainly looks different. Um, stainless steel body, I believe. Be building a new uh, plant near Austin, Texas. They're also getting into the semi business. This will have four electric motors, a range of around 400 miles, so it'll be used for short haul range. But it should be a big money maker for them because uh, it will appeal to customers who can drastically reduce their, their uh, costs uh, for their, uh, their trucking operations. Ford has just announced a F-Series electric coming out next year called the Lightning. They're taking orders now. Um, the, uh, they just announced to a Ford Maverick hybrid. This is a, a smaller car and this is a uh, starting price of around $20,000. So this is re really kind of the first electric that um, uh, kind of comes down into the uh, uh, reasonably priced range for many people. GM is an electric Hummer pickup. It's going to be priced though at 112,000. It'll have a unique crab rock walk feature, which allows to move sideways to get in and out of tight spots. So you can pull up to a parking spot and the wheels turn and you can go in sideways, come back out sideways. This is going to be built at the Hamtramck plant in this area. Uh, they've newly named that plant Zero for zero emissions. And they're going to have an SUV version of the Hummer uh, later on. Chevy is going to have an electric version of Silverado this year. Chrysler is looking at a minivan that might feature sliding front and rear doors. Another new local company, Lordstown Motors, they bought the GM Lordstown, Ohio plant. This will feature an electric motor in each wheel hub has a 250 mile range and will sell for about 52,000. Company's experiencing financial problems right now, but plans to begin deliveries in 2022. Oh, this was, I'm sorry, this is a local company. Uh, Lordstown is in Ohio. This is a, a company in Ferndale, Michigan that last I heard was still looking, they have the engineering done, but they're looking for a manufacturing partner. I don't know if they found one yet. So there's just an awful lot going on in this area. If you want something more powerful in an electric, uh, you can get this uh, Porsche Turbo, 750 horsepower rating, uh, only goes 192 miles on a charge, and uh, you got to part with 186,000 dollars to get it. But uh, if you want to have some fun, so let's talk about self-driving uh, electric vehicles. GM is building the self-driving taxi type vehicle. It's investing $2.2 billion in the Detroit Hamtramck plant to build this in the Hummer. Cadillac division developing its electric SUV scheduled for production next year. It'll offer super cruise driving feature. This is currently offered on the Chevy Volt Cadillac. Plans to have an all-electric lineup by 2030, and they're taking orders for this now. 
You've probably been seeing the ads. Well, GM has actually changed its corporate logo to reflect its strong focus on electric cars. The M represents a plug, and the line under it represents the Ultium battery platform they're using. They plan to have 30 electric vehicles by 2025 and are investing 25 billion to get there. Here's a totally self-driving electrical vehicle with no driver's seat, steering wheel or pedal brake, or um, brake pedal. This is the first vehicle cleared by the federal government to operate without the presence of a human. Deliver packages limited to 25 miles an hour in neighborhoods, built by Neuro, a robotics company in Mountain View, California, and they got permission to put up to 5,000 of these on, uh, on the road over a two-year period to test them. And so this is the first time the National Highway Safety Administration has given authorization for a totally uh, self-driving car without, without a human in it. Um, this is being built by Roush, a Plymouth Township company that also built a prototype of Google's original self-driving car. You might have seen some ads for Domino's Pizza are using these to deliver in certain parts of the country. IXR Mobility is setting up a self-driving electric 12 passenger shuttle in this area for medical appointments, pharmacy visits and shopping. This is gonna serve the Detroit Medical Center, the VA hospital complex and 17 nearby senior housing high rise uh, apartments. Google subsidiary Waymo has operated its driverless taxi service to the public uh, open it up in Phoenix. It's been tested for five years. It uses radar cameras and LIDAR, a system using lasers. They use the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid minivans as a, as a vehicle. Well, let's look at the business side of this just for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, from 2018, but it's changing slowly. But these are plug-in ownerships per capita. Look at Norway. 55% of the population uh, had uh, uh, electric cars. They, they treat California as a separate uh, country here, I guess, because of their different 13%. And then the, if you take the total US, you get 3.4%. So, you know, electric certainly is not there yet in, in, in the US, but um, as we can see, it's, it's moving. Uh, registrations for 1,000 people, the darker is the better. So you can see California, 8.4%. 6.4 per 1,000 people, Michigan, 1.5. And again, that is gonna be changing as we get more and more uh, local uh, electric cars uh, manufactured. How about the type of manufacturer? Well, this is back in, in through 16, so it's a little out of date, but General Motors, Nissan, Tesla, Ford, Toyota, and BMW, and VW were the, the leaders. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. The, the blue line is the hybrids, and you can see that's still increasing. And the green line is the uh, all electrics. And, and that's increasing, but about double the pace of the hybrids. So hybrids are still popular, but all electrics are, are gaining. What about fuel cells? Well, uh, that's another option as we mentioned, but um, they're being researched. Uh, to see if they're going to work out and also whether if they do whether we can get enough fueling stations and again you need charging stations for battery powered cars and refueling stations for fuel cell cars tesla's setting up their own network of charging stations and their cars have online directions to them vw has some to use with their cars for an extra fee uh, if you want to get into this uh, you can get a home charger service from dte they say that charging a battery overnight is like paying around a dollar a gallon for gas. The average cost to install is uh, $1,200. This includes a second meter, takes advantage of reduced costs during the night and weekends. And then the charger itself is an additional $500. I met with an old friend, uh, Frank Marcus, technical director of Motor Trend Magazine uh, to review my draft a few months ago before I started doing these. And he added some valuable operations. And he has an article on electric trucks uh, in an issue of Motor Trend. And uh, I'm sure he has several more articles since then. Um, it's good to get together with him. 
Uh, Frank played my son, Tony Kirby, in this production of You Can't Take It With You, the Plymouth, Plymouth Theater Guild in 1990. Yes, that's 30 years ago. Anyway, uh, let's, look at the, uh, let's look at the future. Uh, plug in, all electrics are gaining popularity over hybrids as we, as we saw. Charging stations are increasing, but many more are needed. Now the Biden administration is calling uh, for government vehicles to be all electric. They're also pushing for 500,000 charging stations uh, across the nation in this uh, new uh, infrastructure bill. Um, and a factor affecting Tesla and GM sales that they've both sold over the 200,000 electric vehicles and no longer qualify for the $750 tax rebate. So if you wanna get that rebate, you have to get uh, one of the other brands and then pretty soon those will, those will be gone. Um, fuel cells are an alternative, uh, alternative possibility to batteries, as we said. Self-driving electrics are a reality, but it'll probably start with commercial vehicles such as delivery vehicles and taxis. I, I kind of doubt in, in my lifetime that, that I will have a self-driving uh, electric where I'll sit in the back seat and read, you know, while the, while the car uh, takes me somewhere automatically. Um, it, it'll happen someday, but I think in my lifetime, it's more likely that I'll, that I'll ride in a taxi or a delivery vehicle or a bus or something like that that'll be uh, uh, driverless and uh, self-driving. And again, as we said, Ford and GM are investing big time in this because uh, they believe in it. And uh, they wouldn't be putting this kind of money in if they didn't um, have the confidence. Well, there are a lot of other issues that uh, have come up in some of my other presentations uh, on this. Um, the power grid. So we all get these charging stations at home and we start ch charging our cars at night or during the day. Can, can the local power grid take it? Are we gonna be blowing transformers and so forth? Is there enough energy? Other question is, all right, you got to produce all this electric energy. How do you produce it? Well, if you produce it with coal, uh, producing plants, is that a plus for the environment? So you're reducing the emissions from the car exhaust, but you're increasing the emissions from the coal plants. Now, there ought to be some scientific way of, of figuring out, um, you know, the, the net gain or loss from that. I'm sure there is, but that's one issue that, that concerns people. And also, what about the batteries as they get older? Uh, how do you dispose of them? Some of the parts can be recycled. Uh, there are even uh, operations going where they take old batteries and they kind of put them together and they may only have a 30% of their original charge, but they can, they can be used to store energy uh, in certain situations. And so they have a use for them there. So that's another thing is how do you, uh, how do you get rid of these? Uh, and, uh, and what happens if you buy a used one? If you buy a three-year-old or five-year-old car, your battery life is gonna be down, I don't know, somewhere maybe 80% of the original, 70%. That's okay, I guess, but you'll have a shorter range, uh, but um, you should understand that. And, uh, and then what happens when you go to sell it? Now you're down where uh, a person says, gee, that, you know, uh, I don't want a car that's uh, with a very low percentage of useful battery. So uh, it's gonna be interesting to see the resale thing is gonna change. Uh, in this whole area. So a lot of, lot of interesting questions and things. And before we uh, go to the, uh, I have a couple other summary things, but let me, <clears throat> I always get interesting things sent to me because I'm doing this program. So this was something that uh, uh, supposedly, supposedly came up at a recent computer ex expo. Bill Gates reportedly compared the computer industry with the auto industry and stated, if Ford had kept up with technology like the computer industry has, we would all be driving $25 cars that got 1,000 miles to the gallon. In response to Bill's comments, Ford issued a press release stating, if Ford had developed technology like Microsoft, we would all be driving cars with the following characteristics. For no reason whatsoever, your car would crash twice a day. Occasionally, your car would die on the freeway for no reason. You would have to pull to the side of the road, close all the windows, shut off the car, restart it, and reopen the windows before you could continue. For some reason, you would simply accept this.
the oil, water, and temperature and alternator warning lights would be replaced by a single, this car has performed an illegal operation, warning light. The airbag system would ask, are you sure before deploying? Occasionally, for no reason whatsoever, your car would lock you out and refuse to let you in until you simultaneously lifted the door handle, turned the key, and grabbed hold of the radio antenna. Well, anyway, a lot of fun, a lot of fun comparisons. Okay, um, let me uh, end up with a couple of things. Uh, here are some resources that I use. I got these at the Northville Library. You can get them on interlibrary loan if you don't have them at your library. And I'm sure there are other resources that you have that we didn't, but a, a couple of good books. Um, I like to put in a plug for the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. I'm on the board of directors. Uh, maybe you've seen some of these signs entering the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. Um, we're part of the National Park Service. Uh, we're the only National Heritage Area in the country for uh, automotive out, out of the 50 some heritage areas. And our charter is to preserve, interpret, and promote automotive and labor history. Uh, you can go to our website, sign up for a weekly automotive history article emailed to you. It's free. It's a nice little article. And uh, if you like automotive history, uh, it's a good way. We get most of our money from the Park Service, but we have to uh, earn so much on our own locally. So we really would appreciate it if you like this concept to become a member for 30 bucks or 20 bucks for seniors. And, and we really appreciate that. And that membership gives you some discounts to many automotive museums. We also have a speakers bureau. We have a free half hour presentation on Motor Cities for service clubs and people that meet at lunch. And then we have longer presentations on automotive history such as mine for a fee. Here's some of the other uh, productions I have. We've done uh, Henry Ford, his company and his life. We've done that at your library. I also have one of Billy Durant, Walter Chrysler, Studebaker, Packard, Nash, and Hudson, the Dodge Brothers. I got an auto, uh, aircraft one, the Wright Brothers, Bill Boeing and Donald Douglas. And uh, then I have some on uh, uh, interactive ones where we talk about, uh, we have actors portraying them. We have one with Ford Edison and Firestone, one with Ford Durant and Chrysler. And my whole interest is in leadership. So I branched out into Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt, Joe and Rose Kennedy, Harry and Bess Truman, and Mark Twain. I portray the men in these, and I have an actress that works with me, portrays a woman. We have a lot of fun. We interact with the audience, and maybe we can bring one of those to your library someday. And we have a brand new one we're starting uh, in January that uh, would be available in the spring on Orville and Catherine Wright. So uh, anyway, that's what I do. Here's uh, one of our interactive ones with uh, Henry Ford on the left. Thomas Edison, the center, which means bears a strange resemblance to me and Harvey Firestone. I also published my first book this spring, uh, Motor City Drama, Behind the Scenes, Building the Big Three with Ford, Durant, and Chrysler. Now this is a fictional history. Uh, people would ask me when I get my presentations, you know, did you write a book? And I said, no, there are enough books on Ford, Durant, Chrysler, and these people, what could I add? Well, one woman said, you know, they, there were a lot of interactions you talk about. Why don't you do a fictional one where you actually take us into those conversations? And that's what I did. So I take meetings that actually happened that were reported and the outcomes, and I make up the conversations uh, based on my knowledge of these people. And so I don't distort history. I try to add to it. And it's fun. It's a fun read. It's 10 bucks. You can get it on Amazon. And it makes a good Christmas present or <clears throat> gift for somebody if... Uh, if you know somebody that likes automotive history. Okay, uh, I have a website at the bottom, doreproductions.weebly.com, and I list all my uh, public presentations. This one was listed there, and I've got some other ones coming up. So uh, if you uh, want to know uh, what I'm up to, or if you want to contact me, I've got that other information. And so at this point, let's go to Q&A. And, &A. and uh, we've got plenty of time, and we have a um, small but enthusiastic audience tonight, so <laughs> shouldn't have any any problem getting time to for discussion. I'll I'll leave this up during if, if any of you want that. Yes, Sheila. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Russ. Uh, really appreciate you uh, sharing via your great narration on your research and photos. Okay. Most interesting. And I'm pleased that uh, Berkeley Library is recording this so that we can share it. Um, certainly, I know of other groups that would be interested uh, in hearing the history. Um, I wonder, I missed what you said about the tax credit. Um, I drive an old Ford Escape and at Motorbella, I was looking at the new Ford Escapes, the hybrid. Uh, very interesting. I've been to the dealership, but I have those um, credits, the tax credits expired or the rebates? Not, not for Ford. I don't, not yet, I don't think. Just for Tesla and um, GM. Oh. Oh, okay, great. I'll check into that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And again, I don't know if it's, I, I should know this, but I don't know if it's on the uh, hybrids or just on the all electrics, but oh, I, okay. think it's, I think it's on both. Okay. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I'm going to check into sure. that. I was yeah. amazed with Tesla um, selling 100,000 cars to for leasing. Is it to yeah. Davis or Hertz? Hertz. Yeah. Hertz. So you can, you can rent it. Before long, you'll be able to rent a Mustang from Hertz. Wow, amazing. And lastly, have you ever heard of the Sebring uh, electric car? Our son has one. It was, and he drove it in the Woodward Dream Cruise. I can show you a picture. Um, okay. But the, from a mother's standpoint, it's a little um, frightening in that he has to have a fire extinguisher. Huh. In, <laughs> what, year, what year was it built? Uh, 1977. Huh, no, yeah. I haven't. I oh, and it's, it's not coming up, I guess, on the uh, there. But I'll email it to you. So Thank you. Yeah. It's a cute little car. It gets a lot of looks. And there's yeah. one, I believe, a similar one at Greenfield Village. Or oh, Greenfield. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure, there, I'm sure. And there, there's a company out in California. I've forgotten the name of it that somebody in my presentation last week brought up that uh, <clears throat> their son is involved out there. So they're oh. springing up all over. Right, but just like you know, at one time there were 500 uh, car companies in, in the United States, and out of that came Ford, Chrysler, and GM. You know, so um, it, it takes a lot of sifting out to uh, to get the ones that really that really make it. Right, right. Well, again, thank you so much. Good, Tim. Do you have anything to uh, any questions or comments? <clears throat> Sorry, I just wanted to get off the mute above. But no, I, I really appreciate the uh, the presentation. So um, I, I kind of work in the industry my, myself here at American Battery Solutions in Lake Orion. Uh, oh. We do lithium ion uh, battery products. So great. Well, did you know did you know uh, all the history of the field? So I, I did not actually. I, I was going to yeah. say I really enjoyed seeing some of the early history. Um, yeah. You know, I, I work in our HR department. And so, um, you know, some of our um, leadership was, was part of some of the earlier days. And so hearing about, you know, nickel metal hydroid and the chemistry yeah. and how they've changed is um, really, really interesting as well, too. So well, I really appreciate it. I'll tell you, talk to somebody and uh, have me come in and uh, give a presentation to employees at lunch hour or something sometime. We, we definitely welcome that. We, uh, we we talk about some of the uh, the previous iterations of the batteries that you were mentioning, actually, yeah. in some of our new hire orientations. So um, I, I may take you up with that and uh, find you on LinkedIn, share some of my, my info as well, so. Okay, and if you can't find me, why um, Matt can find me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, no, uh, very, very well done. Thank you, one, for putting it together, but two, um, you know, really enjoy, like I say, just yeah. seeing some of the history. I've got lots of notes and everything, so. Good, good. Well, I um, appreciate you folks coming. I know it's tough. Uh, uh, these days, uh, people are kind of getting zoomed out, you know, and, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the the live stuff is is not quite comfortable yet for a lot of people, and it's it's not easy. It's not easy for people like Matt to try to do some planning. And uh, I gave uh, twenty four presentations the year before the COVID, and it dropped to about eight the following year. And, wow! And and most of those were on Zoom, you know, and now it's picked up. This year, it's probably doubled because of Zoom, and it's starting to pick back up. And I got a few live things going, but uh, it's it's been it's been uh, a challenge, as we all know. Right. Good. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, Russ. Thank, thank you for your time and expertise, and thanks again to the friends of the Berkeley Public Library for sponsoring. All right. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you as well.